We get, I got one guy in Africa, he sent me a letter and said this, I'm taking your sermons off the internet and showing them to my church. He, that's how he's preaching to his church. I'm preaching to his church. Hallelujah. So I'm preaching to Africa. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I said, I'm preaching in Africa. Glory to God. Amen. You know, you just got to understand God's doing things. Uh, we've had prayer calls go out of here. Somebody had cancer. Prayer calls got taken to them. They're cancer free. Amen. God's working. I mean, we, I went down to Fayetteville on uh, Thursday and I ministered down at Pastor uh, Bill Carver's church. Man, did we have us a time. Oh, my. And then the end of service, the gifts of the Spirit started manifesting, word of knowledge. And everybody, everything that was called out, the people were instantly healed. Everything. Now, one thing we, don't, we, we couldn't check was uh, the, last, the last thing that we had was that somebody had problems with their kidneys. And this, this, uh, this little pregnant mama stood up, and she came up with tears pouring down her face. She said, I just came from the doctor this week, and they told me that my baby's kidneys are not developing right. They want me to come in for more tests. Well, you know what? The great physician showed up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have no doubt. I don't have any doubt that when they get back, they're going to find out they're, they're well. The kidneys are well. Amen. Wow. Well, I just might be a circle. That might be a, a you know, quirk. No, 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 no. I don't believe in quirks. I believe in miracles. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, they told Belinda she, she would have to have a heart transplant. She did. Yeah. It just wasn't by the doctors. <laughs> and we have, we have documented, we have the records from the doctors. We have the doctors saying that it was a miracle. We have, I mean, right here in Greensboro, you know, she had postpartum cardiomyopathy. That's where the heart goes flabby and won't pump the blood. They said, we got to get your heart strong enough to have a transplant. She couldn't even have a transplant. It was so bad. And by the time they got ready to do the transplant, she's walking out of the hospital. Jesus showed up. Well, they made a mistake. No, you don't have specialists. Specialists don't make mistakes. Not like that. Are you here? You've gone home. Hallelujah. Jesus showed up. Amen. Jesus is, what's that? Sent 10 different specialists. This isn't one, one guy making a mistake. It's 10 people. Amen. When it went a mistake, Jesus came by. I want you to know that God is good. Hallelujah. And whatever you're dealing with and whatever you're facing in life, there is an answer that comes from above. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? So this morning I'm going to preach a different sermon than I told you I was going to preach. We'll preach the conclusion of what to do with faith seems we can victory lost tonight. I, don't, I am going to finish that tonight. This morning I'm going to, I'm going to Amen. preach a different message. So we're going to read Romans chapter 4, 13 through 25, then we'll read a, partial, a portion from uh, Wayne's translation. It says, For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for when no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Hallelujah. Not to that only which is of the law, that means the natural, the natural Jew or Israel, but also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Hallelujah. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, and calls those things which be not as though they were. Ooh, we could, we could stop and preach there for a while, couldn't we? I said we could stop and preach there for a while, couldn't we? You know how many faith people have taken, taken a rap, have taken a slap in the face for going around saying, I believe that I receive me. Oh, you're just one of them Christian scientists. You're, you're, making, you're saying stuff that's not true. Well, God said, the Bible says God calls things that aren't as though they are. Weymouth translation makes it even clearer. It says God makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Hallelujah. God makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. That's not a lie. That's faith. Now, see, I, I'll tell you something. You don't ever go around and say, I'm not sick. That's, a, that's not true. What do you say? I believe that I receive my healing according to the word of God, so therefore I declare that I'm the healed of the Lord. I'm calling which be not as though it is. You don't call things that are as though they are not. See, the saints say, I'm not sick. It's called things that are as though they are not. That's not, that's not faith. But to say that I am the healed of the Lord is called that which is not as though it is. That's faith. You're calling a higher law into operation. You're calling what God has made provision for. You're summoning it to your circumstance. Glory to God. Somebody shout, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be noticed that his faith was based on that which was spoken. 
He didn't just make up some whimsical thing out of the clear blue. He said, according to that which was spoken. He believed according to that which was spoken. Well, you have the written word that's been spoken. Yeah. Amen. You've got to believe according to what was spoken. Not according to what, you know, you dream up in your head. And see, there's things you can't have. My wife's one of them. People, people want to believe, I'm, I believe I received their wife. I believe I received their house. I be, you, well, what's your promise for that? Where's your basis of faith for that? You can't have my car, my wife, and my kids, or my dog. Although some days I'd be glad to give her to you. There's, a, there's, there's days she's aggravating. Hallelujah. But you still can't have her either. The dog. <laughs> Lord, now I know how Moses felt. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, I tell you, you can't be weak in faith. You can't have a partial faith. You can't have a wimpy faith. Are you here? You've got to have strong faith. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Oh, my. I said, oh, my. Hallelujah. But was strong in faith. You can't stagger. But I'm telling you, when you go out and you go ahead and step out in faith, you've got to be strong and you can't stagger. Now, you can have some swagger, but you can't stagger. Are you here? I tell you, men and women of faith should have some swagger. They are, I'm telling you right now, I got it. Hallelujah. But you can't be stole, my God. Oh. You can't be staggering. You've got to have some swaggering going on. Hallelujah. I know, kind of be kind of go, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. That's what it, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nathan said the guy sang that song with the jazz and stuff. He said he, he didn't have any soul in it. He said you got, you got to get soul in that song. You got to get some spiritual soul when you start stepping out in faith. You got to know. You got to know. Amen. There's got to be a confidence about you. Now, not an arrogance, but a confidence. What? Well, go on, let's read some more. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. You know, there's an old country song years ago called Almost Persuaded. You know, I was almost persuaded to let strange lips lead me home. You know, you remember that song? How many of you old country folks remember that song? You know, almost persuaded. You know, I'm telling you, we got a biblical reference kind of along that line. The king t told Paul, he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That wasn't good enough. Almost won't get you in heaven. Hello? I mean, you know, you can say in the end zone, it's, I mean, it's the, it's the last point, last shot of the game. It can go into the basket. It can swirl around. It can go halfway down, and then the back spin up, pulls it right back out of the rim. And you can say, he almost hit it, and you're still lost. Are you here? Almost is not enough. He said being fully persuaded. Being fully persuaded. Hallelujah. There's no doubt or unbelief in there. Glory to God. That what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Amen. Glory to yeah. God. Y'all here, you're going home. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness, not that it was written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. The fact that see, the Bible writes stuff for you. You get some people, they have like things in the Bible that are just there just to be uh, space taker-uppers, you know, just space fillers. I mean, you know, I, I mean, listen, y'all, some of y'all got, got, everybody's got at least one in your house called a junk drawer. Now, what's a junk drawer? Where all the stuff is, you don't know why it's there, you don't know why you kept it, you just decide not to throw it away, and it's in there. And eventually, you open it, and the top of the, the, the drawer pulls all the stuff back out into the cabinet below. Now you got more room. And you put more stuff in. Are y'all here? <laughs> anybody got anybody like that? <laughs> no, that's not, no, see, that's, not, that's not what the stuff's in the Bible like. You go, why did I say that? How many know what I'm talking about? You go out in the garage and you got boxes from something from Amazon from three years ago sitting out there and you're going, why did I save that box? Uh, I, it was a good box. Yeah, but what's the purpose? Let me say this. There's nothing in the Bible that's there without a purpose. Are you here? God put it in there for a reason. 
You know, some people don't like the Old Testament. It's not even necessary. You know, the Bible says that the Old Testament's there as an example for you. Now, the King James says in sample. It means example. All right? And so he says here, this wasn't written for his sake alone. Um, there was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it sh shall be imputed, if we believe on him, there raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Hallelujah. And so we have here this, this passage where it talks about that Abraham was fully persuaded. He didn't stagger at the promises of God. He was strong in faith. Amen. Glory to God. But verse 18 is what I'm after. Who against hope believed in hope. Now that's a little, that's a little awkward to us in King Jimmy. Y'all know who King Jimmy is, don't you? That's the authorized version. Now, just so you'll know for your, for your, your accuracy, the authorized version was never, never officially and finally accepted. The King, King James authorized the beginning of that. He never accepted the final results. So it's the semi-authorized version. Okay? And if you've got a hat that says 1611 KJV is for me, bless your heart. I can't read that. You know, why don't you go get your white clip and read it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 18 is what I'm after. It says, who against him? That makes, that, that makes as much sense as this. Wayman says this, under utterly hopeless circumstances, he hopefully believed. Here's what we're after. Utterly hopeless circumstances. Now, whether you are in that place right now, you've been in that place in the past, I can, I can guarantee you one thing. Either you have been or are going to be in a place where it looks like it's utterly hopeless circumstances. You're going to face tough things. Oh, yeah. You're going to face the evil day. Yeah. The Bible says to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand when? In the evil day. That doesn't mean that, you know, it doesn't say put on the whole armor of God just in case the evil day shows up. The Word of God says put on the whole armor so that you'll be, uh, you'll be able to withstand in the evil day. In other words, it's a coming. Some of you might be in it right now. Some of you might have just come out of it last week. Some of you thinking, oh, life is good. I got strong faith. And next week you're going, oh, Jesus, where am I, where are my feet? Because yeah, right. your feet are where your head was two seconds before. Now, that's not unbelief. That's not a negative confession. It's the fact. You're going to face tough places. Now, there are people who gone, went around and preached for years. Brother Hagin used to get on them. We got people out there who believe they're going through life on flowery beds of ease. Not going to have any trouble. You just ain't lived long enough. Are y'all here? You gone home? Well, I thought you were a faith preacher. I am. Faith has to fight a battle. Faith has to win something. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I'm telling you, if you're not overcoming something, then you're not using your faith. There are things you're going to have to deal with. And there are going to be places you come to in your life where you're looking against it, and it's utterly hopeless. It looks like an utterly hopeless circumstance. But fear not. I said, fear not. Amen. We got the faith of a father Abraham. We got the example of our father Abraham who in utterly hopeless circumstances showed up. And I'm going to tell you something. When God shows up and tells you at 99 years old that your 90-year-old wife is going to have a baby, that's utterly hopeless. If you go read your Bible, it says this. It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. You want to put that in modern day, just really graphic terminology? Her womb dried up. As a matter of fact, I nicknamed her Prune Womb Sarah. I'm going to teach her womb look like a prune. She's dried up. There ain't no eggs. There's no ovulation. There's nothing going on. It had ceased to be with her after the man or women. But God said, he staggered not. That's not only a hopeless circumstance. Are y'all here? People get weird when I start talking along those lines. Folks, this is what happened in the Bible. Took a night. Listen, listen, Guinness Book of World Records won't even put it in there. They got some woman that was 65 years old, had artificial insemination. I'm talking about, we're talking about no artificial. We're talking about, I mean, the natural way of doing things, and it was supernatural. She was dried up, and she had a baby. Supernaturally. God even said, oh, oh, if Ishmael could just be the one that gets, gets in on the promise. He said, you know, Ishmael is not the seed of the promise. I will bring the, the promise through Sarah. Hello, it's coming through Sarah. Amen. He had a word from God, and he said, under utterly, utterly hopeless circumstances, he believed. Yeah. How many in here have, have ever faced an utterly hopeless circumstance? Yeah. Oh, my. Everybody, I tell you, you know, there, there, are days, there are days you look up and you think, my God, my God, my God, if you don't show up and do something, I, I am sunk. And you can't say that. 
You got to say, my God, my God, my God. It looks like if you don't show up, I'm going to be sunk. But I know this. My God is faithful. My God has the answer. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Glory to God. You're the head, not the tail, above only and not beneath. Glory to God. He said, he'll cause me to rise up. Hallelujah, on wings of eagles. I'll run and not be weary. i walk and not faint. Glory to God. I want you to know that I trust my God. Hallelujah. He's more than able to bring me out with a strong arm. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. glory. But, Abraham, but Abraham says he was under utterly hopeless circumstances. Utterly hopeless. People call you up and say, how are you doing? Oh, my God, you just don't know what I'm going through. Well, that's not what you're supposed to say. I know, listen, we want to. I'm telling you, we want, oh, Jesus, I just tell you, thank you for calling because I had to tell somebody how bad it is. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, stand back and let me sing hee-haw. Gloom, despair, the agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Now, how many of you have felt like singing that? How many of you have sung it? Okay, I got people raising their hand. There you go. I'm telling you, think, my God, I need, they need to bring that show back just so I can sing that every week. Maybe that's why it went off the air. It was causing too much unbelief. I mean, you know, he, she met another and pfft, she was gone. I mean, all that stuff they sang. Well, well anyway, th- I'm sorry. It says, under other hopeless circumstances, Weymouth, he hopefully believed so that he might become the forefather of many nations. Listen to this. In agreement with the words, equally numerous shall your posterity be. Here's what you got to do. See, when you're facing those utterly hopeless, hopeless circumstances, you've got a choice. You can choose to agree with the circumstances, or you can choose to agree with what the Word of God says. And where your agreement ends up is where you're going to end up. I said where your agreement ends up is where you're going to end up. And so if you agree with the circumstances, well, there you go. But if you'll change that and start saying what the Word says and be like Abraham, who, you know, the, the, he, was, he became the father of many nations because in agreement with the words. Do you know the word covenant means to say the same thing as? To say the same thing as? How many know what the word amen means? Now, I know a lot of people don't know what it means because they wouldn't say amen in some places. The devil's going to read, going to clean your clock one day. Amen, preacher. So be it, preacher. Hey, don't you say amen there? We used to have brother, a guy back in our church in Greenville. We used to call him Brother Amen. Because he had this deep, deep, resounding bass type voice. He didn't need a microphone. He didn't need anything. He'd say, amen. And it would just echo through the whole building. And the pastor would be preaching. He'd say, you know, uh, the devil, devil has brought sickness on people. Amen. I mean, he, whatever, he said, hey, man. Finally, the pastor had to call him and said, look, you can't say hey, amen to everything I'm saying. <laughs> I'm making a point, but you don't, wanna, you don't want to agree with the point that you're going to get it. Amen is a covenant agreement word. When you find the promise that gives you the answer, you say amen. Amen? For all the promises in him are yea and in him, Amen. Now, again, the Weymouth for that verse says this. All the promises of God, whatever their number, find their confirmation in him, and our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. Now, Weymouth has a, has a, mark, has a note there on the word confirmation. He says literally that phrase means the yes. For all the promises of God have the yes in him. Now, here's, here's what you got to do when you're going to step out in faith. And you're facing utterly hopeless circumstances. You can find a scripture that deals with it. You've got to find the word of God. Why? Because there is where you can come into agreement and get into faith and overcome and win by faith and what the word says. You're not going to get it a hoping. Amen? Hoping that a praying. God will move by some hook or crook. Somehow, some way. Amen? 
That's 2 Corinthians 120. The promises of God, whatever the number, have their confirmation, or the, the margin of Wayman says just the yes in him. And for this reason, through also I, him, also our amen. What do you mean? See, the promises, he's always, he, he, you know, this, when that verse tells you that all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are already what? Yes. See, I grew up classical Pentecostal. We had, we get real spiritual. Yeah, God answers prayer three ways. Oh, yeah. We can get sing song in about it. Yeah. He answers them yes. And sometimes I know, and sometimes, this is the one they always loved, and sometimes a maybe. I used to go in and tell people that. Yeah, I didn't know any better. Why people, that's what everybody said. I think they ordered me to know what they're talking about. They've been around for a while. Yeah, but they've been reading, the, the, the problem was they kept reading the book of First Opinions. You all know what that book is? That's the one that has the cleanliness is next to godliness in it. And the law helps those who help themselves. That's, that's chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 2. And then the Lord answers prayer three ways is verse 3. Book of first opinions. What do you mean by that? People just make stuff up. It sounds good. My, you see what it is? I said, my, my experience. I ran across this verse one day when I, not long after I got saved and been telling people what the, God answers prayer three ways. And I went, oh, my God. It says all the promises of God in him are yea to him, amen. He answers prayers two ways, yes and amen. And then I read in Weymouth one day, I liked it, went through the roof. God answers prayer one way. For all the prompts, see, you're not be really praying unless you're saying what the Word says. All the promises of God, whatever their number, have their confirmation or the yes in him. What you get, where you get in trouble is when you start praying about things that the Bible don't promise you. Hello? Like that girl called me up one day on the telephone and said, the Lord showed me I'm supposed to marry somebody. Well, why aren't you talking to your pastor? I can't talk to him about this. Well, you know, when that goes off, I just kind of put, I reach over and turn, the, turn on the music for Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone because I know I got Fruitcake City on the line. You can't talk to your pastor. You're going to call dial a pastor up and try to get an answer. Hello? Talked to her about 15, 20 minutes and finally got it out of her. We went on and on and on. Never, they never dated, never talked, but the Lord had showed her they was going to get married. Yeah. Yep. He's a deacon in the church. Going, she was going to be by his side in the ministry. And finally, the, she let the cat out of the bag. Yeah, wow. I said, well, why have you talked to him? Why have you gone out? Well, he's married. And I'll be honest with you, before I thought, before I could stop it, and I really wouldn't have stopped it if I could have, it came out of my mouth, Sister, you had too much pizza last night. That was an indigestion dream. God ain't going to show you you're going to marry somebody else that's married and, 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 you're, and, and you're chasing them down in the church. And they, they, you know what I'm saying? Going go to chase them down in the church, and they ain't even interested in you. But the Lord has showed you. The Lord ain't showed you nothing unless it was the Lord of the flies. The maggot God. Hello? Y'all got quiet on me out there. Yeah, she didn't like that. Well, what, that's why you couldn't go to your pastor. You got one of his deacons and you chasing him down. I'm going to come up with that the Lord showed me. Why don't you just go stay with the promises of God? Just stay with the promises of God. It's safe. I said it's safe. As a matter of fact, that's the only place faith is. I know Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If it's not a promise from God, you can't have faith for it or Bible faith for it, scriptural faith for it. It's got to come out of the word to produce faith in the heart of the believer. And a lot of people are trying to get answers from heaven and trying to get God manipulated and doing stuff, and they're not standing on what the word of God says. And they're just hoping and they're praying and they're whimsical. This happens that some kind of whimsical something's going to happen and they're going to get an answer and they're not getting what the Word says to do. And they're not standing on the Word. I want to tell you something. If you want answers and you want results, you want to win, get into the Word. Amen. Are you here? You've gone home. Because the bet says here that when he was in utterly hopeless circumstances, again, we're over there, he hopefully believed so that he might become the forefather of many nations in agreement with the Word's. Equally numerous shall your posterity be. He came into agreement with the word of God. Faith got released. 
When you're in an utterly hopeless circumstance, honey, brothers, sisters, I'm telling you, you don't have time to Mickey Mouse around. You don't have time to play games. You don't have time to be cute. You don't have time to call up somebody who's going to send you something and you're going to throw salt over your shoulder and turn around three times and mail it back to them with $10 and go, Woo, praise God. I, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, people do something, all kinds of stuff. Get on the radio, get on television. Here, I'm sending you the special anointed salt shaker. Pour, and and I, I think I'm joking. I am not joking. Put it in your hand, throw it over your shoulder. Turn around. Send me ten dollars and you'll have the answer to your prayer. Really? And here's the problem: people did it. That salt's not anointed. As a matter of fact, we don't even see in the Bible any anointing salt. <laughs> I see anointing oil, but it was a type of the Holy Ghost coming on people. Hello. I don't understand at points of contact, but I tell you what: when points of contact always have to have money involved, there's something wrong. If you don't believe me, go ask Simon the sorcerer. Give, offer them money saying, give me this power also that whosoever I lay my hands, that might be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And Peter rebuked him and said, thy money perish with thee, thou child of the devil. Didn't go over real good. Stop looking for some gimmick. And I believe in praying for people. I believe we can get into agreement. See, we've got to get into agreement. But you can't be in agreement. You're not gonna get into, I'm not going to get in agreement with you unless it's Bible-based. Let's be honest with you. Don't ask me to pray and agree with you about something. That's what that, that woman called me. She wanted me to agree with her that God would give her that man. I wouldn't do it. Why? I wasn't Bible-based. You can't get me to agree with you about something that's not Bible-based. Hello? Pray that so-and-so's wife die, and I get her, get, and I get the husband. You idiot, what are you talking about? <laughs> I ain't agreeing with you. If we're going to come into agreement, it's going to be on the Word. Why? Because that's where faith is produced, and that's where we can find a point of contact to release faith. Amen? Yeah. I know we can, we can have a point of contact by laying hands on people, but the Bible tells us to lay hands on people. See, that's biblical. In other words, we follow the Scriptures. Somebody say Amen. Hallelujah. These circumstances of life are going to come against everybody. My, my, my. I'm just getting started. You know, that's all he's saying. I'm just warming up. I, I'm barely getting warmed up right now. I'm just getting ready to get cranked. So how many give me at least a half an hour? <laughs> I got two hours. All right, thank you. That was 30, hour, hour and a half. There was one in the audience. That's two hours. I tell you what, though, now I preached, I preached so hard, and then I, I went back up, took the microphone from the pastor, and I could see their faces. Oh, my God, he's going to start over. <laughs> he's getting ready to go again. Hallelujah. I felt like the Energizer Bunny. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Look at some of the circumstances. Jesus said in Luke 6, 47 through 49, he said, Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and doeth them, I will liken you, and I'll show you to whom he is like. Now, if you, if you back up a couple of verses from that, there are people that came to him, heard his things, and did not do them. And he said they would build their house on the sand, and the storm would come, the wind would blow, and the great would be the fall of that house. But he says in verse 47, that here's, here's the, the, the uh, other side of that. If you come to him and hear his things and do them, I'll show you who he's like. A man who built his house on a rock and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And uh, listen, and when the flood came, the, st the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like the man which the foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The difference between someone who wins and someone who loses is the foundation you're building your faith on. Are you building it on the word, or are you building it in hope and circumstance that maybe somehow something's going to go your way? You're going before God and whining. Well, Pastor Ed, he prays, he gets the answers. I just don't understand. I come up here and I say the same thing and I don't get anything. We got cheese in the bookstore. We'll go with your wine. Three people got it. Extra sharp. That wine is not going to do anything. Are you here? It's not even prayer. It's disguise complaining. I'm praying and not getting answers. Pastor Ed's praying, he's getting answers. You're whining. 
Hush that. And it's not faith to whine. Amen. All you're going to get is mad. God ain't doing anything for me. I mean, you're, before the end of the week, you'll be singing the worm song. <laughs> Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Think I'll eat some worms. Go right ahead on. Hallelujah. I'm going to eat the good of the land. Hallelujah. Because if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Amen. Amen. You say, you're being harsh. I'm trying to get you to wake up and understand that if you're going to face tough places and tough circumstances, you better be ready. When, they, when, they go in, when you join the military, one of the things that they, that they do, I think probably in every branch of service, is they take you into this big warehouse, they shut all the doors, they turn off all the lights, and they gas you. And in the midst of that, you've got to break your weapon down and put it back together without whining. <laughs> now, in the warehouse, the, all you'll get, the only result you'll get is a sergeant in your face chewing you out from one side to the other, probably with a chaw in his mouth and spitting it all over you. And they make you do 4,000 push-ups or something. But on the battlefield, it'll get you killed. You've got to know how to take that weapon down, and you've got to know how to put it back together in the middle of battle or they'll get you killed. Are you here? And they train them that way deliberately. They make it tough on them deliberately. Why? So that when they face the real circumstances of life, they'll win. They'll overcome that circumstance. Your weapon jammed in the middle of battle, you've got to be able to get that thing cleaned out and put that together and ready to use again. And you've got to be able to do it in less than a minute. Because all it takes is one or two minutes and you're in trouble. Hello? So well, that's why they do that. There's a training process. And the training process for the believer is you get into the Word of God. And you feed on the Word of God. And you know how to take the Word of God and apply the Word of God. So that when you face the real battles of life, you know what to do. And if the circumstances show up that aren't going your favor, you know what to pull out and what to use on it. Jesus did. After 40 days of fasting, the devil came to him to tempt him. And three times, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus says, it's written, it's written, it's written, and defeated Satan. He defeated him on the battlefield because he was so full of God's word. Well, he was the word. Well, he, look, he, he stripped himself of his rights to deity and the glory and walked among us as a man under the covenant. Hello? He used the word. He taught them how to use the word. Amen. Joshua, by revelation of the Holy Ghost, said, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you'll meditate therein day and night that you be observed to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt deal wisely in the affairs of life. Jesus said tough times are coming to those full of faith and to those who aren't. The ones that stand are full of faith. You're going to face the same storm. Hello? Ellie is going to face the same storm as Gina. The storm's coming. The storm will show up. Now, if Gina falls and Ellie stands, it's not because God chose one to fall and one to stand. Right. It's because what foundation they put their life on. That's the answer. Now, see, people run off. God's sovereign. God can do anything he wants to do. He calls Gina to fall and Ellie to stand. That's not what Jesus just said. And I think he knows more than your Ph.D. guy does. Jesus said, if you build the house on the right foundation, you'll stand. They faced the same storm. I said they faced the same storm. One fell and one didn't. And it wasn't because it was a different storm. It was a tougher storm. And as a matter of fact, they looked like, apparently they built look, similar looking houses. The foundation on one and the foundation on the other were different. Yeah. One was built on sand, one was built on the rock. You want to win when the utterly hopeless circumstances show up? You be full of the word. Amen. Finally, my brother, Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Now, some folks think, I'm under grace. I'm just going to lay here and look at the finished work of Jesus and the wiles of the devil ain't going to show up. Uh, you's in trouble. I said, you's in trouble. You're going to wake up, your house be gone, the roof be gone, the car be gone, the kids will be gone. Amen. And I guess you're going to have to play that country song backwards then. Y'all heard that, hadn't you? What happens when we play a country song backwards? Get your dog back, get the house back, get your girlfriend back, get your, you know, get your car back. Oh, anyway. Y'all are, are with me this morning, aren't you? 
If I had lights back there further, I guess I'm not even in the light like I need to be, am I? Uh, Bill, Bill gets on me all the time. I, I, I need lights back here. Hallelujah. So I can walk all across the chairs. Pull a Bill Bozanski and walk on the tops of them. Amen. He says, but you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. What? Put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Now, J.B. Phillips' original translation, I think his, his, his modified version changed. And a lot of times when these guys made some of these paraphrases, uh, you know, people start using them, quoting them, and then they say, oh, i got to go back and make it more accurate. And they go back and clean it up and change some stuff. But I, I got to read one of his old ones one time, and it said this, having done all, having fought the battle to the end, remain on the battlefield, ready to do battle again. See, the good soldier doesn't go win a victory and quit. The good soldier puts the devil on the run, and then he stands guard and says, bring it back on, son, I'm ready for you. Yeah, yeah bring it on, chump, I am ready for you. You jive, turkey. Just go ahead and all day, jive, turkey, chump, you know, I mean, dog, bring it, whatever, whatever area you're from. Having fought the battle to the end, remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. Ooh. See, that's a person of faith. Person understands that, that one victory, you know, that's great, that's wonderful, but I'm not going to turn my back on him and let him, I'm going to stand my ground. I've taken this ground and I'm, take, and I'm standing this ground. And if he shows up, I'm ready to go again. Yeah. Amen. But notice here it says, having done all the stand in the evil day. Be ready to be standing in the evil day. Tough days are coming. Are you here? Yeah. Well, how do we respond? We respond in faith. Yeah. Well, if you look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I think I might get done this morning. Since I got an extra two hours. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. This is what Paul says. For our light affliction which is but for a moment. Now that sounds, think, well, Paul, you know, Paul, go read 2 Corinthians chapters 11. Re read chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians and see what Paul's talking about. Three, in, nine, three days a night in the deep, three, three times he received 40 lashes, save one. And you understand the Roman scourge, scourge was not these little Texas bull whips. They were, they were tethers about this wide and about this long with rock or glass or bone put in them. And so when they, when they did it, they drug it back, and it just ripped the flesh open. 39 of those. Are you here? 39 stripes with that. Three times he received that. He said 40 save one. That's 39. That's 40 minus one is 39. Okay? All right. If you read that chapter, you know, I mean, he was let down over the wall. He was, and he goes, says, I was in fastings often. I was in nakedness often. I was in thirstings often. You know, I mean, in perils in the city, in perils in the country, in perils with the brethren. I mean, everywhere he went. He said, Paul's talking about how bad it was. But you know what he says here? Here? Because he's got to have this in mind when he's writing this because he writes it later on in the, same, in the same book. He says, our light affliction is but for a moment. What are you going through? You call it maybe an utterly hopeless circumstance, but Paul looked down and said, that's a light affliction that's just for a moment. It's just for a moment. Why did he say that? Why could Paul say that? Because he knew his God. He knew the one that had the answer was greater than the circumstance he was facing, praise God. He, so he looked at those things and said, it's but a light affliction. There's something that's a far more exceeding way to glory for me, praise the Lord. Amen? He goes on, he says this, which is but for a moment, which for us, which for us, worketh for us, a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Listen to verse 18, what he does. While we look not at the things that are seen, for the things, uh, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. The word temporal means subject to change. If you can see it, it's subject to change. How is it subject to change? By looking at that which is eternal. Forever, O Lord, Thy word is settled in heaven. See, the faith man and woman gets their eyes off of the circumstances and get in on what thus saith the Lord. Because the circumstances are trying to talk to you. The circumstances says, I'm taking you down. The circumstances says, I'm greater than what you, your faith is. The circumstances says, I got you today, boy. The circumstances says, you know, uh, I'm coming after you. But you got to be like foghorn and leghorn. 
I say, I say, I say, I say, boy, you're bothering me, son. You're bothering me. And then start quoting the Bible. Amen. Well, the Word of God says, I don't, I don't listen, about uh, in October of uh, 2011, Jesse and Shannon had moved out to Rama, and they were going, you know, they were in Rama, and, and I got a phone call from Jesse about 1 o'clock in the morning our time, and she says, Daddy, uh, Shannon, Shannon's not doing good. So she, I said, what's wrong? She says, well, she's cold as ice. Her hands, her feet, and her face are yellow. The rest of her body, her, they're burning, her face is burning up, but her body's ice cold. She said, and I, I said, well, I'm going to hang up, I'm going to pray, and I'll call you back. So I went and told Janie, and we were praying, she, and Janie said, and Janie, Janie agreed, we got to tell her to take her to the hospital. So I called right back, I said, get her to the emergency room. So they got her to the emergency room, and I'm, I'm here, Jesse's out there praying. I mean, she's, she's doing everything she knows to do. I mean, she's, she called Cindy Duvall, Cindy said, Every, everything's going to be all right. And Cindy's got that real deep, raspy, you know. Shannon, Shannon does it, and it sounds just like her, you know. It's all right, all right. Anyway, you know, Jesse. Listen to me. It's all okay. Jesse was praying. I'm praying back there. You know what the devil was telling me? He said, I'm going to kill your daughter. She's a thousand miles away, and there ain't a thing you can do about it. Now, fear tried to grip my I didn't go tell my wife that. I knew I was in a battle. Are you here? And I said, no, you will not kill my daughter. She'll live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Hallelujah. And they got her in the hospital, took her in, and the first diagnosis was she had a brain hemorrhage. They came out, they, looked, they said, she's got a brain hemorrhage. It's not a good report. Re brain hemorrhages are not good reports. What are you going to do when the battle's on, folks? Are you going to believe, whose report? Remember saying, we sing that song. Whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. Well, what's the report of the Lord? See, it's one thing to sing the song. You've got to know what the report is. Yeah. You got to know what the Word says. You got to be able to pull it out and put it into action, glory to God. You can't pull out no Swiss Army knife on the devil. You better have you something to cut his head off. I mean, one of them big old, you know, the era, uh, the time period era swords, you know, knights of the round table type stuff, man. It takes a man to hold it up. And when it, and when it comes contact with Nick, Nick comes off. Amen. So I'm sitting there, I call, so I call Jesse. What, you know, she said, well, you know, they said they, 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 they're, they're doing more tests. Every time the doctor would come out and give a report and go back, came back out and said, Don, well, it's maybe, not, maybe it's just a, it maybe it's spinal meningitis. Maybe it's meningitis. Well, that's not a good report. Every time he'd go, Jesse's in the room praying with her, own, over, praying in the Holy Ghost, and, uh, and, and, and Shannon kept getting a little better and kept getting a little better. And while they were running more tests, and they come and say that, well, this is, this is some strange viral thing with some weird fever. And went back and ran more tests. Now, by the time they came back out to this point, Shannon's sitting up in Indian style on the, on the table and heard Jesse say, I am healed, I am whole, from the top of my head to the soles to the tip of my toes. First Peter 2, 24 says we were, and if we were, then I am. I am healed, I am whole, from the top of my head to the soles to the tip of my toes. Finally, the doctor came back out and says, we don't have a clue what it was, but she's doing good, take her home. Went from brain hemorrhage to go home. You got to know what to stand with. You got to have a faith that says no in the midst of a circumstance that's, you know, when, when your child's going to die, when your sister, they're telling you they're going to die, Brain hemorrhage is death, you know, or vegetable. I mean, there's, just, there's not a whole lot of good, good things to that. Those are not good reports. But I refuse to let the devil in. And Je now, see, Jesse wasn't telling us everything because she didn't want to say. She didn't want to say it. Okay. Well, you know, well, she's sitting up. I'm, ca I'm calling back and forth. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11th chapter. We have a whole chapter of men and women called the great faith chapter yeah. who faced utterly hopeless circumstances oh, thank you. hallelujah yeah. but they won i said they won and the bible put it in there so you can go read about them yeah. and find out about them and walk around and say if david won i can win yeah. if samson won i can win yeah. hallelujah are you here who are all those guys they won i win now 
the only bunch in there that get, didn't get delivered, read it. They chose not to get delivered. You read it. He said they chose. The other thing, they, they, they chose martyrdom or whatever over being delivered. He said they chose. He didn't say God made them. They made a choice just to, just to go ahead and go home and get ready for the big deal. Read it. Hallelujah. Are you here? You go home. How many are still here? Glory to God. Children of Israel came to the Red Sea. Now, you were talking about an utterly hopeless circumstance. You're coming up to the ocean with two million people and the army of a bunch of people who were ticked off with you. Why? You, you, they just gave you everything they got, and they realized what they did. They gave you all the jewelry, all the gold, all the clothes, all the good stuff, and you walked off with it. And they went, what was I thinking? And the Pharaoh says, let's go get it back. And so they took off. And, they're, and, and of course, they're trapped between them and the Red Sea. That's pretty utterly hopeless, isn't it? That's, that's, we, you know what term we use for that today? You're between a rock and a hard place. Are you here? You're between a rock and a hard place. You ever been between a rock and a hard place, Mr. C? Oh, yeah. Mr. C's been between a rock and a hard place. And he's lived longer than anybody in here, so uh, he knows what we're talking about. It's not, it's not a good place to be, is it? No. It's not a good place to be. Hallelujah. They're between a rock and a hard place. They're between the Red Sea and an army that wants to cut their throat. Hello? And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. You cannot let fear grip your heart. You cannot let fear grab a hold of you and begin to choke you and to suffocate you with the what ifs and how you're going to and all this. And yeah, how are you going to make it? How are you going to overcome? I'm telling you, you don't have time for that. You gotta have time for the word of God says He'll put me over. The word of God says He's my sustainer. The word of God says that He's Jehovah Nisi, my banner of victory. Glory to God. Hallelujah. My God is God. He causes me to triumph. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. That means always, means always, means always. That means I'm gonna triumph in this situation. Can you say amen? So, so Moses said, Fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord that he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you see this day, you shall see them no more again forever. See, God do something. They, 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 may, they may just think they're going to get away. God says, you ain't going to see them again forever. Why? Because I'm getting ready to take them out. He didn't tell them that, but he was getting ready to do it. God don't always tell you how it's going to end up. He didn't always tell you how he's going to do it. Hello? I know when you get into a tight, you run to the mailbox. Just waiting for the check to show up. Are you, uh, come on now. I mean, you start looking at folks like they're the one going to be bringing you some money. Some folks run around looking for dogs. Maybe they got a bag of money. Stand still. See the salvation of your God. Get your gaze upon him. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Put your confidence in him. How he gets it to you is his business. The way you hook up with him is by faith. Amen? Glory to God. Let's jump to verse 16. But lift up thy rod, stretch out over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten my honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the angel of the Lord went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from there before their face and stood behind them. Now, they got God on one side and the sea on the other. But see, here, there's a, there's a place of faith. And what does it say? What does the Bible say in the Old Testament? It says, I'll be your re reward. R E R E W A R D. It means, I, let's just use a military term. I got you six. You step out in faith, I'll cover the backside. You don't have to look over your shoulder. You don't have to wonder what's coming. You don't have to wonder if something's going to reach up and get you on the backside. God's got you six. Amen? Because He knows what's in front of you. Faith will make the way. Amen? 
and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that, no, that the one could not come near the other all night. And the wind blew, and it, it divided the sea. <coughs> and they went over on dry ground. And then when they were standing on the other side, the, the Egyptians tried to come in, and the water swallowed them up. Now, one, one theological seminary used to teach it was no big miracle. The water was only six inches deep in those days. Woo! Glory to God! A whole army and horses drowned in six inches of water. What a miracle! Yeah, they, teach, they would teach in their seminaries that the water was only six inches deep. It wasn't a big miracle they went across. What about the whole army that got drowned? If it's only six inches, I don't know many horses are going to drown in six inches of water. I mean, even when they lay down, they can't get their head down there. Hello? I mean, a little horse lays down, his head still about fall off the ground. Big old head. Are you here? I got news for you. It's going to be hard to get most people down in six inches of water and drown them. Much less a trained army. That's stupid talk. Now God split the sea and then drowned the army. And then they had them a Holy Ghost meeting. They got on the other side, and Moses began to lead the people. They began to sing, I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. Amen? They begin, that's that, what they, people call it Miriam's song. That's, they begin to sing that song about the horse and the rider being thrown into the sea. They had them a Holy Ghost meeting. Glory to God. Amen. Fight your battles. You'll have times of song and dance and shouting some victory. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm telling you, it's just good. You're going to face places, but if you'll keep your faith in God, God will deliver you out of those places. God will bring you out. You had the three Hebrew children in the, in the fiery furnace. I'm telling you right now, you know, I'm gonna, it's, it's over in, um, I'm not going to read it because we're, we're, we're all running out of time. And I could preach all day on this. Hallelujah. really want to, but I'm not. Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 28, Nebuchadnezzar had put out a decree that everybody had to worship his idol. Yeah, yeah. The three Hebrew children wouldn't do it. The guys who got Nebuchadnezzar to pass the, the, the ordinance came to us. Hey, shout about me, second of Bendigo, I'm doing what you told him to do. He said, bring them here. He was mad. He was ticked off. And he, he said, I hear you're not worshiping my idol. They said, listen, we're not even going to be careful to answer you about this. We won't worship it, nor will we ever worship it, because we only worship the true and the living God. Boy, that ticked them off double. He said, he deferred us up seven times hotter. Throw them in. Go cook. I'm going to make an example of it. I'll tell you what. Now, some of you, how many of you have been around a fire? Just get a nice thing. Now, Nathan can make a good hot fire. You have to back up from it. He'll get it so hot. I mean, you just get, I mean it's just hard enough to even sit in there. It's too hot. They will get thrown in the midst of a big furnace that's seven times hotter than normal. It's so hot that the Scripture says that the men who threw them in were killed. When they went to throw them in, the heat killed those men. Now, they just they didn't even get in. They just on the outside and it killed them. But then Nebuchadnezzar looked down there and they were walking around. Amen. Just like fire, shut up in my bones. I mean, they have them a Holy Ghost meeting right there in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, did we throw three in there? They said, yeah, there's four. Jesus never leaves you and forsakes you. And even when you're in the midst of the fire, Jesus is with you, praise God, and sustaining you and keeping you and protecting you so much so that the fire couldn't even touch them or burn them. It bur now listen, it burned the ropes off their hands, but it didn't burn their clothes or their hair or anything. As a matter of fact, they didn't get singed, and they didn't get scorched, and they didn't get burned, and the clothes didn't get smoke on them. They didn't even have the smell of smoke when they came out. He said, hey, guys, come out. And they came walking out. Well, I don't believe that. That's your problem. You've got to believe. If you want to win, you've got to believe. These aren't Bible stories. These are Bible examples of how to win and not lose. These are Bible examples of how to go into an utterly hopeless circumstance and come out on the other side, not smelling like smoke. One guy said one time, he said, man, if you are going through hell, don't stop. Keep going. Some Christians stop, get out, pick out the cooler, set up and have a picnic and whine about how bad it is. Man, when you're in the midst of going through hell, you do not want to stop. You want to keep going and get out of there. Are y'all here? You're cussing in church. You're not cussing. Hell's a real place. Hell is a, an example of all that Satan has to offer. And he'll bring it to your life. And he'll try to get you to stop your car and get out and just wallow in how miserable you are. No. Say, I'm coming out of the other side, and I won't have the smell of smoke. My hair won't be singed. I'm coming out stronger than I went in, glory to God. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm coming out victorious. Yeah. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't take a whole lot of heat to scorch hair. I used to work at Parker's in Greenville, and we used to have to get back and clean the, the deep fat fryers. And they had, on the back side of them, they were gas. And they had back side, they had a flue that came up. And we'd be back to clean those, those stainless steel panels with degreaser. And if you leaned your head back tomorrow and that thing came on, it'd shoo, you could smell it. Just the, just, the, just the exhaust heat would singe your hair. And it's a nasty smell. We finally started taking wet towels and putting them on our heads on, and stuff down our shirt and putting our hats back on. So when it came up, we'd hit that towel. We might get a little steam, but we wouldn't get burned. These guys were in the furnace, and they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't get singed. So hot it killed people. They came out walking. And, of course, then, and then what happens is, uh, your God's the real God. When, listen, when Christians live their faith and win their battles, they're a witness to the world. I saw you go through that. Yeah, my God delivered me. I thought there way he's going to come out of that. My God delivered me. My God is faithful. My God is bigger. My God is greater. He didn't send me into it, but blessed be God, he's going to get me out of it. He's already made a provision to get me out of this mess. Hallelujah. Y'all hear? Your faith will bring you out. So when you're in utterly hopeless circumstances, or what appears to be utterly hopeless. You can take God's word. You can stand on God's word. You can come into agreement according to that which was spoken. And you can walk out victorious. You can walk out a champion. You can walk out as a born-again, spirit-filled believer full of the faith and the Holy Ghost and stand up and say, my God, he is God and there is none else. And devil, you just gave me your best shot, but I'm not just standing. I'm standing and ready to take you on again, chump. So bring it if you want to, but you're going to get the same results. I win, you lose.